welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad you're here and I'm glad to be back because speaking about a digital, I've had my own digital challenges the last couple of days with some tech connection, but thrilled to have today as a nonprofit tech talk. So this conversation dedicated to technology, so grateful to have one of my dear friends and colleagues join a, joining us today, Ellen owens Carsey. Uh, joining us from the Car Say Consulting Group to talk to us about, is your nonprofit digitally inclusive? So Ellen has a lot to share about this and uh, has so much experience and insight. So we're going to dive deep with her in just a moment. But before we do, we want to remind you who we are if we haven't met you quite yet. So hello to you, Julia Patrick. Julia is the CEO at the American Nonprofit Academy, and I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. Really honored to be alongside Julia day in and day out, unless I have tech issues, <laughs> but thrilled to have today's Nonprofit Tech Talk sponsored you know, by our amazing presenting partners. So thank you to our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit thought leader, your part time controller, nonprofit nerd, as well as staffing boutique. These companies, most of them, have been with us in this four year journey, 900 plus episodes. And if you missed any of them, they've helped us capture them. You can find them on our archives, which are um, an app platform. So, speaking of all things tech, this is where you can find us on technology. You can download the app, you can find us on broadcast, and you can also find us on podcast form. So, wherever you like to binge, watch, listen, uh, you know, to your entertainment, we invite you to find us on these platforms. And again, Ellen, we are thrilled to have you with us today. For those of you watching and listening, we have Ellen Owens Carse joining us today. Ellen serves as the owner as well as esteemed advisor at Carse Consulting Group. Welcome to you, Ellen. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Julia, for having me on. Yeah. You know, this is such an interesting conversation because Jared and I, from the get go, when we first started the nonprofit show, it was so apparent to us that if nonprofits were gonna survive the pandemic and all of the other things that came with the pandemic, they were gonna to have to embrace technology. And the nonprofit sector was kind of, we're not known for leaning in and being innovative. And now we're, we hadn't even at that point discussed the accessibility. We hadn't even thought of it, frankly. And so to have you come on and talk to us and actually add another lens, I think is absolutely fascinating. And um, this is for all nonprofits, not just for non a specific type of nonprofit. So let's get into it. And, and I wanna start out by asking you, how do people with disabilities use tech? Yeah, and first of all, I want to acknowledge what you said, Julie, at the beginning is that when we talk about digital accessibility and digital inclusion, you're right. So many organizations had to respond very quickly during the pandemic. They had to spin up technologies they weren't familiar with. They had to do what they had to do. And it wasn't probably the primary conversation of digital accessibility. So now, now is the time. <laughs> to go back and look at your digital assets and reassess where you're at. So individuals with all types of disabilities access technologies in different ways. There are some really exciting emerging technologies, but digital accessibility could be as low tech as understanding the colors on a screen or on a display, the lighting, the font size, but more, um, prominent for individuals with a visual disability are screen readers, screen magnifiers, special glasses. And then for individuals who have physical disabilities, whether they're switch controls, uh, whether it is actually devices like a specialized mouse or keyboard to access technology. But the, the, what makes those devices and those pieces work are how your websites, your apps, your digitally processed uh, attachments in an email are coded or have the right um, coding behind it to be able to be accessible by those technologies. So they have to match. So that that's kind of a high level. Okay, that, that that's frightening because I, I I've never thought about this. Like, I, you know, 
I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, this is like not been on my radar until we were talking in the green room until like the last week. Jarrett, what do you think about that? Well, I was going to say it's fascinating. And I shared in the green room chatter, when I started my fundraising career, it was for an organization with developmental disabilities. And that was 15, 17 years ago, right? And to see the advancement, not only in technology, but this digital inclusion and accessibility right along with Julia, I'm still learning, right? There is so much to learn. And I think it's because, you know, we we haven't, and I'm, I should speak to myself, I haven't, you know, thought of it in this manner. And so bringing light to this for so many organizations is really important, um, especially as we elevate, you know, inclusivity and access right along with diversity, equity, you know, into our conversation. So, so grateful that you're here to talk to us about this, Ellen. Um, let's move into the levels of concern because I want to ask you when it comes to this, like, what are some of these concerns that show up when it comes to digital access? What are you seeing in this space? Yeah, there's there's three primary buckets that we like to talk about these in, and that's the business case, the legal case, and the brand equity case. And so from a business case, Obviously, the more people who can access your website, if you're doing business or communicating via a website or an application, a mobile app, uh, the more people that can access that, the better. The more people that can get the information, the better. Uh, I've experienced where I've had colleagues and friends who have to use assistive technology to access a website, say, I'm not going to do business with that organization or I cannot purchase, make a purchase because I can't access the information. So people will make decisions based on that, even if they don't have a, a disability, uh, if they are taking the stance of saying, I believe in making sure that organizations are inclusive and accessible. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, there are regulations, the ADA compliance and what's called the, we call it the WCAG uh, compliances, and I'll get to that a little bit later too, uh, around digital accessibility, there are now organizations getting letters uh, from uh, saying you need to address this issue. Uh, recently, the federal, anybody who's a federal contractor or linked to the federal government, uh, so if you're receiving a federal grant, uh, you have to comply with their digital accessibility guidelines. And so it now comes to whether or not it could impact your ability to win those uh, contracts. Uh, so we see this in the same vein as what they call GDPR, which is the yeah. Data Privacy Acts. Yeah. These will probably expand in a similar way uh, as there's more attention given to it. So there is a legal compliance perspective. So it is in your best interest to start addressing it. And we'll talk about those ways uh, later on about how to start. And then brand equity. So you want your brand to be one known for being equitable and inclusive. Uh, so Jerry, you mentioned the, the you know, greater emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that speaks to that. So being able to say uh, that you're addressing it, that you have an inclusive website is very, very important for brands. Wow. I had no idea, Ellen, <laughs> about the federal side of this and the requirement. Um, is that like in the fine print, uh, you know? Cause I wonder, I really wonder how many people are aware of that. Never heard yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, you know, and this speaks to probably the number one step and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but awareness. And so it's probably not in the fine print, uh, but it's certainly something that if it's not on your radar or uh, it, you're signed up for those listservs to get information about that, you may have missed it. Um, and sh I, you know, I, I'm no different than either one of you. This is a journey. This is a process of, of learning. And so I'm fortunate to have a great partnership with the American Foundation for Blind to help me on this journey. And they are really the ones that are advising and guiding me in terms of the details behind us. I consider myself a great advocate and an understander of technology and how to bring the two together and understanding uh, the business needs from a technology side as well as a process side and then bringing the experts 
um, in from American Foundation for Blind. Wow. Well, let's talk about that then a little bit because you're sent, you're telling us things that I've never, A, um, and I'll be honest, I've never considered, um, B, didn't even know, don't know about. Um, so then if you think about that, how do we even determine if we're, we're accessible? Um, how do we go about not only making the pledge to do better, but how, how can we do better? I guess maybe that's the question. Before we get that letter, <laughs> you know, yeah. we don't want a letter. Yeah. Well, and I got to say, this isn't like a quick fix, right? When I, when I yeah. hear you talking about this, I'm thinking, holy moly, we're in the middle of a redesign for our website. It's really arduous. What do we do? Right? Yeah. So how do we determine this, Ellen? That's a great scenario. So you're getting ready to do a refresh on your website. Um, I would say one of the top things to do is to ask your website designer, if you're using an outside firm, what is their experience in ensuring that your website uh, content is accessible and inclusive? Uh, so that's number one. You can ask them what their experience is. And I think some key things that you would want to hear from those uh, firms are something like, we understand or we comply with the WCAG compliance requirements of 2.0, something, uh, you know, something a little more specific than, yeah, we got it. <laughs> so, um, and, and what is the language that you can put on that? But I think if you don't know, or you're a do-it-yourselfer website designer, um, either the platforms, what do the platforms have included into the website development platform that makes sure that it's inclusive? Does it have an accessibility checker? Um, but if, if all else, uh, nothing else, there are tools that you can put your website URL in and it will do a scan. Now, I have a very big caution around that, as I have learned, is that that is a scan and there is no way to determine how accessible your website truly is without a manual uh, check on top of it. So to get a scan, to get an idea, if you're saying, oh, my website's accessible, run it through one of those checkers, you might be surprised. Wow, okay, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm like, it is a head shaker today. You know, I love, that's why, this is why we're doing nonprofit tech talk because yeah. we, like I said, Jarrett and I have talked about this. Um, you know, this is where we need to be thinking. And, and so, wow, Ellen, amazing. Talk to us about the steps that we can take because now that you've educated us to even be thinking about this, you know, how do we really formally say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna make this commitment? I love the idea of the scanning and engaging some folks on you know on your platform, but how do we do this? And maybe maybe the question is, how do we phase it or break it into something that we can we can achieve? Yeah. So if you take a step back from a planning, let's let's think about your planning a redesign or a refresh of your website. It is really about bringing all of the players to the table and ensuring that they understand that this is top of mind, not only in this one project, but throughout all of your processes, your business process. So bringing it to a conversation of not only maybe cybersecurity compliance, but let's talk about making sure that it's compliant with the WCAG guidelines and ADA guidelines. Mm -hmm. So bringing it into your day-to-day -day business process is number one. And the way to do that first is to educate yourself. You don't have to be an expert, but once you start to educate yourself around some of the top things around digital accessibility, you will be more aware. So then you can know to ask the questions and engage the experts. So education, awareness, and bringing it into your day-to-day -day business. Um, the next thing is when you're ready, it is easier to integrate digital accessibility into the design phase than rather than remediation. Yeah. But we understand that you know it is a reality that many people have sites put up that they do need remediation. And it is can be very complex or there can be some very easy steps to resolve some issues. And so what's What's very helpful is to engage an expert in this area to be able to identify the ones, there's levels of compliancy within WCAG. So what are high risk, high levels of non-compliance versus low levels? What are the easy fixes? And then start that journey. And then you 
there's not a certification per se, but there's attestation to say that we are in the process or we are compliant with WCAG guidelines uh, 2.1 or 2.2. Okay, will you, will you, we know ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, talk, give us the, the that, it's WCAG, can you help me understand that? Yeah, it's W-A-C-G. If you Google search W-A-C-G, yeah. you will find those, yeah, guidelines. And I, I can't rattle off the acronym off the top of my head. The <laughs> other resource uh, would be the American Foundation for Blind website. They have a, several links mm -hmm. um, out there. Um, the other piece of information that's out there under the W-A-C-G, when you research that, and I think it's um, uh, WACG.org, there is a list of personas to consider when developing your website, which I think are very helpful. You don't have to come up with those personas, but it's someone who may have a developmental disability, someone who has a physical disability, and gives you some scenarios to consider about how a person with a specific type or multiple disabilities would access technology or what they might use. So that that is very, very helpful in terms of not only your typical user persona, and that's how, let's face it, websites are typically designed, yeah. is to say we want to address the majority of our target audience versus universal design to say let's capture a broader group and ensure as many people as possible can access information. I have lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, me too. My head is like spinning. I'm going to start with, I love that you mentioned, you know, here's some steps we can take. And so going through this scan for our website is a great, I'm going to say cursory, right? Start. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned a manual scan. So my question, and it's, there's a lot in here, but how, I mean, obviously we don't, you know, snap our fingers and overnight we are now, you know, digitally inclusive. What is the timeline to implement this and specifically the manual scan? What is the timeline of that? And then what can you help us understand if we're like, okay, we're taking the pledge. We want to do better because we know better. <laughs> what does that timeline look like? Yeah, it, it depends yeah. Uh, on how many, how many uh, gaps are found in the assessment phase. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the process, though, typically looks like when you engage a firm that does include a manual process. So American Foundation for Blind has what's called Talent Lab. They have certified individuals who are users of the technology. And you can become certified as a, uh, a tester. There's ways to do that, but they, they not only do that, but these are users of these different technologies on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that will go through and do a scan of your website to ensure that all of the pieces are, are accessible by those technologies, okay? So it ranges depending on how deep you want to go, how many pages are in your website. If you are looking at offshoots of the website, if you're looking at mobile applications, there's a lot to consider in terms of the size. Uh, and so the, the way that, or to give you an example of one of the things that's important to look at from a manual scan, buttons. When you click on a button, for example, there is a link usually that takes you somewhere. Mm -hmm. or um, uh, there's a, a picture and making sure that your pictures are all tagged uh, that say a description. Well, in some cases, those tags may be there, but it is not a description of the picture. It may be a link to a coupon code in some cases yeah. Yeah. because that's how they've designed their website. So the, the right way is to create an alt text tag for the picture describing what's happening in the picture not to link it off to something else. Um, so that would be caught by a digital scanning mechanism to say, yes, your pictures are alt tagged, but it's not alt tagged correctly. Right. So that's why the manual scan is so important. It may scan it, say, yes, there's something there, but it's not the right uh, context or information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's important. The, the process is to uh, really look at the, flows and use cases for your website. How do people 
typically go through your website. What do you want them to do? What do you want them to find? What is expected outcome? Um, I was looking at a website that had, um, it was a, uh, it was, it was, a, let's just say that it was a public website, public facing website that many, many people would probably need to access general public. And it had kept leading to multiple pages with multiple offshoots of links. So it went almost 10 pages deep. Mm -hmm. So to think about that journey and to have to navigate, navigate as a user who's cited, sometimes that's frustrating for me. I can't right. imagine having to listen to a screen reader read all these URLs, www.http forward slash, and reading all of this to you as you hover over those URLs and just keep linking down into pages. So right. when you feel frustrated with a user experience, just think about every detail being read back to you by a very fast voice. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this question before we move on. Who's leading this in the federal government? Is this the ADA, um, you know, that whole piece? Or where are we getting our leadership from um, so that we can all start kind of marching in the same direction? Because you know, uh, Foundation for the Blind is an amazing organization, but at the end of the day, they're a nonprofit. They're an organization. They have a huge voice in our country, but is there some sort of uh, government or, or statutory agency that's kind of setting some of these parameters? Yeah, there are. And then I would say that probably the other organization that is uh, really big in advocating for ADA compliance is the National Council for Independent Living. Uh, that is one of their primary focuses is to advocate for disability uh, rights and justice and equity. Uh, and then there's other organizations that advocate for this. So um, obviously there is a level of compliance at a federal level, ensuring those, those statutes and those um, compliances under the ADA guidelines, which is kind of the umbrella are held, people are held accountable to. This is the direction that things are moving is to ensure that people are being held accountable to uh, accessibility. And so you see this a lot in transportation uh, and other technologies. We could go down a rabbit hole around wayfinding, autonomous vehicles, a lot of different other areas that are exciting. It's very exciting. And it, it helps uh, yourselves, myself as an individual consumer but also very, very important for an individual who has a disability. Yeah, yeah. I see more and more autonomous driving vehicles in my neighborhood, in my community. And I have to say, they are better drivers than a lot of actual drivers. <laughs> I'm like, wow, they yeah. actually use their blinker and That's they right. actually pull out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Well, this is truly fascinating, Ellen. Um, do you work with organizations across the nation? Do you have a specific region that you work with? Talk to us because I can only imagine our viewers and listeners are going, okay, she totally, you know, like shocked me today. We clearly have some work to do. Uh, yeah. What does that look like for you? Yeah, good, great question. I'll, I work across the country. I'll work Outside of the country, yeah, uh, internationally. Um, this is all something that we can do uh, wherever you're at. And I would also say too, that there is an investment to get it right, but we still can work with any uh, size organization to get that process started. So, um, you know, if there's full on deep dives that, um, you know, do have a high price point, but at the same time, we can get started with a smaller scale understanding of where you're at to build out a plan to help you get there um, for any budget, because working with nonprofits, I get it. I understand uh, budget constraints, and sometimes it's a process over time you have to build out. So that was uh, another, another question, and I know we're, we're wrapping up. Um, is there funding for this? Because I can imagine oh, as we submit question. for proposals or we ask, you know, foundations and even individuals for funding uh, to really speak to this from that DEIA lens, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access lens, is there funding out there for this specific kind of work? Question. Good question. I, that is a good question. And I would say yes. 
Although I believe that a lot of times it's a secondary thought, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, for example, organizations that have uh, requests for contracts or grants out for DEAI work, that accessibility piece and really spending the money on what needs to happen for digital accessibility or even physical accessibility, um, it's usually not the priority in there in terms of the budget. Uh, so I would say the more people who start to ask for this in funding yeah. proposals, the more awareness. It's all about awareness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, Jared, I love that you asked that question because to kind of reframe it as Ellen's um, talking about this, I can imagine that there are funders that have never thought of this, but but when they are introduced to the concept, oh, yeah. they'll be like, yeah, we should be marching in that direction because these are the people we're trying to serve, right? right. So well, and and along with the federal funding, right? Like, is that also something we can put in kind of rhetorical, right? Is that something we can put into our our proposals to say, and we want 5% to be allocated towards digital inclusion and accessibility. I would think if they are, they federal are mandating, you know, that we stay compliant, that they hopefully are also helping to financially support this. So there's a lot That's to a think question. about there. Yeah, a lot to think about. Yeah. But Ellen, thank you for uh, elevating this in conversation, coming on to be a nonprofit tech talk guest and thought leader in this space. Again, for those watching and listening uh, today, Ellen Owens Carse has joined us from the Carse Consulting Group, and you can find her online, carsegroup.com. That's K-A-R-C-S-A-Y group.com. Check her out, check her group out. They've got a lot of great insight in this space. Uh, so privileged that you said yes to join us to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, I have learned so much. You know, Jared, I say this all the time. Every day I learn something new. And every day I kind of have that hair on fire moment and I'm shocked. And your jaw um, drops. And yeah, and I'm like, what? You know, but this was really cool because I feel like this links a lot of things that we talk about, but that we've been missing, right? And so I'm so thrilled to have had you on and this is something that we need to really keep looking at and discussing because um yeah we we need to be doing it for for so many reasons again i'm julia patrick ceo of the american nonprofit academy been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself jared r ransom ceo of the raven group and again we are here having yet again another amazing conversation um and this really is is brought to you and, and a lot, we're allowed to do this because we have these amazing supporters. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National New University, nonprofit nerd, and staffing boutique. These are the folks that join us day in and day out to have these discussions. You know, yesterday we had a conversation about mental health and our nonprofit staffs. The day before that, we were talking about fundraising mindset and how to get yourself going when it's tough. I mean, we have so many different types of conversations um, on a on a day to day basis, and it it really reflects, Jared. I think the complexity of 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 our sector. <laughs> Most There's definitely. So much going on that we have to think about before we even actually work in service, right? Um, so again, that's my pitch because I, I'm I'm always amazed by it. Ellen, wow. Okay, I'm gonna look at things a lot differently now, having met you and having had this discussion, uh, which is super powerful, and that's what the nonprofit show is all about. To our listeners and our viewers, to our guests and even to my wonderful co-host, we like to end every day with this message and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.